good afternoon. I'm John Goodall, CEO and co-founder of Lambe. Lambe is a peer-to-peer -peer platform focused, focused solely on residential buy-to-let mortgages. Today, I'm going to talk about the financial crisis and what we as a sector can learn from it. The crisis was a product of mortgage lending, and so the lessons are particularly apt for the real estate players, although they apply equally to all types of lending. Secured lending is supposedly safer than insecure lending, but mortgage lending caused a crisis. Obviously, these two points slightly contradict each other, to say the least. How could a low-risk form of lending metamorphosize into something so toxic? The crisis was born in the USA. Let's remind ourselves what happened. The headlines centered on subprime. This part of the mortgage market had hovered around 7 to 10% of the US mortgage market, and then between 2003 and 2005, it exploded to around 22% of mortgage originations, which is around about 600 billion of new lending in 2005. And how did it grow so quickly? Simple. Caution was thrown to the wind. Lending criteria and underwriting standards became increasingly re relaxed. Stated income, verified assets, turned into no income, verified assets. And that then turned into no income, no assets. It was almost as if the ability to repay the mortgage or even service the interest wasn't a factor in deciding whether to make a loan as long as it was secured against the property. To get around the issue of servicing the loan, lenders introduced adjustable rate mortgages. This sounds fairly innocuous. However, they were also known as teasers where the payments would be very low for the first 12 or 24 months and then would jump up, typically by at least 6 or 7%, so that mortgage payments would double or even triple. It is worth pointing out here that the US mortgage rate, sorry, the US mortgage market is very different to that in the UK, in that the US mortgage rates are fixed for the term, i.e. 20 to 30 years. So we're not talking about a fixed rate for a period and then reverting to a variable that is linked to an interest rate but, which is the norm in the UK, but a low fixed rate followed by a high fixed rate. And here's a typical advert. 1% teaser, no income or proof assets. Not only can you get 100% LTV, but you can throw in your credit card debt too. And this is what happened. As you can see, serious arrears had hovered around the 3% mark um, for about uh, two years. Sorry, for about six years, so between uh, 98 and uh, 2004, 2005. On the face of it, this had been a pretty stable credit performance. Remember, this is secured lending, and so defaults don't necessarily equal losses. Therefore, the risk-weighted return on this asset class, where rates were typically 9 to 12%, were pretty strong. And then in 2007, something happened. The rate of delinquencies had risen to about 15% over a two-year period. In other words, five times as many borrowers defaulted. Why did things suddenly get worse? Well, the approach focused solely on the security relied on house prices rising. Borrowers typically refinanced as prices rose in order to keep up to date with payments. This model breaks down when house prices stop rising. This is exaggerated by the high level of teaser rate mortgages that were expected to refinance once they reverted to the higher monthly payment. Borrowers found that due to the absence of increased home values, they couldn't refinance and were faced with monthly payments that were typically two or three times as high. And thirdly, the increasing loosening of, cr of criteria as investors from around the world look for US dollar denominated yielding assets. This was worsened by the increased use of securitizations so that originators had little skin in the game. What is often not fully understood was this was not just a subprime crisis. Subprime only represented around 22% of mortgages. What about the other 78%? And here you are. This is often the unspoken aspect of the crisis. The credit performance of prime in some ways was worse than that of subprime. Delinquencies have been stable for eight to nine years at 0.3 to 0.4%, and then between mid-2007 and mid-2009, they rose to 3.5%. That is an increase of 1,000%, twice as bad as the 500% rise in subprime delinquencies. In subprime, foreclosures rates tripled. In prime, they quadrupled. The cause, exactly the same. Teaser rates prevailed, the focus was on the value of the property. These mortgages were just taken out by people who had some verified income and a better credit rating. In hindsight, it's very easy to look back and point to the mistakes that were made. However, 
in 2005 and 2006, mortgages, both prime and subprime, had a very predictable history of credit performance, and the data seemed convincing. Bear in mind, during this time, the US had been through the dot-com bubble and burst, the attacks of September 11th, and considerable changes in interest rate. Despite this house price growth and the performance of mortgages, prime and subprime had been relatively consistent and therefore predictable in many people's eyes. As is well documented, the credit rating agencies also took this view. And behind all this, what people could not see was just how much underwriting standards were dropping. They were increasingly automated. And in 2005, despite house prices still rising 10%, and unemployment falling significantly, 16% of subprime mortgages missed a payment within the first 12 months. This was far worse than the performance of 2004 originations, which were worse than 2003. In 2006, they got even worse. The huge demand for supposedly low-risk, dollar-denominated assets was causing lenders to materially lower standards in order to be able to meet demand. The sole focus was on the value of the security, and the view was that any potential losses would be mitigated by the asset, that the loan was secured on. How the loan was serviced was hardly even a consideration. In the UK, subprime hardly existed, but even so, an obsession with the security and a view that real estate prices would not fall drove lending decisions. In the UK, house prices held up pretty well. That's the red line. Residential prices fell about 18% on average, while commercial fell by about 40%. This high significant divergence between different types of properties and locations. Buy-to-let mortgages have been one of the best performing types of mortgages. And 12 years out of the last 15, buy-to-let mortgage arrears had been lower than those of, of owner-occupied. During the last five years, as tenant rental arrears increased and then peaked, peaked uh, in 2012, and that's the blue chart, the actual mortgage arrears of landlords fell by about 60%. This is because, typically, buy-to-let lending is less automated and more focused on the serviceability of the mortgage rather than security. Buy-to-let mortgages have been supported with resilient cash flows. You can just make out the credit crisis on this graph as average rents fell by about 1% or 2%, but the clear trend over the last 20 years is for rents to rise by 2.5% a year. In contrast, average commercial rents fell by about 15%, peak to trough, during the crisis. So what can we learn from the crisis? The securitization model was a factor in the crisis. This is an obvious issue for all peer-to-peer -peer platforms, as typically platforms don't have significant skin in the game. Even those that do don't have much, if any, of their own equity capital at stake. It is an issue that all platforms need to face, particularly as pension reforms and ISAs drive significant new funds towards the sector. Platforms need to ensure that they are not overly incentivized to put lenders' funds into high-risk loans. The performance of US mortgages, both prime and subprime, was failing around the understanding or ignoring market risk. Most lenders were in denial. This time, it's different syndrome. Over the last few years, as the peer-to-peer -peer sector has grown, unemployment has been falling, house prices have been rising, inflation has been low, and interest rates have been low. At some point, this will change, and the performance of loans will change materially. We need to face up to this and understand that credit performance over the last three to four years should not necessarily be seen as a good predictor of credit performance over the next three to four years. And finally, the biggest failing in this crisis is the emphasis on security over the serviceability of loans. It was the biggest flaw in US mortgage lending, prime and subprime. The valuation of security can be volatile and some assets more volatile than others. Underwriting should focus on the ability to service the loan and the security should be viewed as a backstop worst case scenario. If one takes the approach, and then secured lending is safer than non-secured, as defaults will lead to lower level of losses. It is the probability of default that should be the key focus for any lending decision. So, solution, simple, transparency. Transparency can help solve these issues. It is a core principle of the peer-to-peer -peer FA, and rightly so. Most of the major platforms are committed to transparency. And I would like to now commit Lambay to the highest levels of transparency. I'd like to announce that we will not only share our data on a loan book with AltFi, but release all our data publicly on a loan-by-loan -loan basis. Not just the size of the loan, where the property is, and value of the property, but also details such as the level of rent to service the mortgage, the type of property, and the borrower and the lender rate. The borrower rate is the best indicator of a risk for a particular loan. We'll publish this for every loan that we make. Every lender on every platform is taking some risk. We believe that they should be compensated for the risk that they are taking. We'll therefore publish the lender rates alongside the borrower rates for every loan, 
so that lenders can see that they're getting the lion's shares of interest and thus compensated for the risk that they are taking. Our underwriting process will remain largely manual and affordability is the center of our approach. Our published levels of rent and therefore rental coverage for every property that we lend against will support this. Market risk is potentially the elephant in the room for the sector. We conducted a stress test in December and will continue to do so on a regular basis. These will be done independently into Bank of England criteria and they'll be published on our site and also released to Altfi. Over 2015 and 2016, the sector is predicted to grow to a level that couldn't have been envisaged even 18 months ago. The potential for growth is huge. For the sector to be viable and significant in the long term, we must learn from the errors in the years preceding the crisis. Thank you very much.